Now, I don't know if you've seen the news or not, but STI is officially Asia's worst, worst equity performer. Now, that is very sad because we are Singaporeans. And more importantly, you know, many of us have some Singapore stocks or buy STI index simply because of home biasness. Now, in this video, I'll be addressing for you, is STI still worth your investment? And if you are dollar cost averaging, should you still be continuing in that journey? I hope to clarify all this for you. And towards the end of the video, I'll be sharing with you, you know, more details on where I see certain sparks in STI, where could it turn towards in future? Now, there have been a lot of names thrown at STI. Some have called it super terrible index. Sounds bad. And, you know, I've even a private DM that I received from a fan that suggested, hey bro, uh, maybe stop recommending STI index. I get that point of view, but I'll also be sharing with you a contrarian thought that should, should be something that you consider. Now, nowadays, when I look in terms of forums, a lot of new investors, young investors, are keen on American shares, are keen on NASDAQ, are keen on uh, ARK ETF, are keen on Apple shares, Microsoft shares. Very few people are interested in DBS, UOB, these kind of traditional names. So a lot of new investors are very interested in US equities. Common questions like these, if they're looking to invest for 20 years, should they just buy US equity? Now, I'll try to make some comparisons. I'll try to help you understand your opportunity cost when it comes to investing in SCI. Hopefully, there'll be a lot that we can cover in today's video. Hi guys, welcome back. Now, to start things with, let me address the white elephant in the room, which is STI's horrific recent five-year performance. I'll pull up this chart for you to see over here. The red shaded area is STI's performance. If you look in terms of five years, it's declined 10.81%, correct? Um, loss a bit is okay, but when you rub it in with an opportunity cost of an investor who can invest in technology such as the NASDAQ, you realize that the gap in terms of performance is humongous. NASDAQ in this example has gained 141.39%. If you compare that you know, against a loss of minus 10%, that is a difference of 150%. An investor putting 10,000 in NASDAQ will have 24,100 now. But investor putting in 10,000 in STI worth only 9,000 left. So there's a big, big difference. It is no wonder that, again, all those funny names, super terrible index, are true to an extent. But again, investing is always looking forward. That's why in the next section, I'll be prepared to explain on risk. And that's actually relating to capital asset price model. And this CAPM model actually describes risk versus expected returns for assets in particular stocks. Now, I've learned this in business school, and just in case you haven't seen it before, let me try to help you understand you know, key parts. First, expected return versus risk. One unit of expected return, one unit of risk. Conversely, two units of expected return, two units of risk. It seems like higher expected return, you need to take on higher risk, correct? And that actually uh, creates a problem. Because over here, a lot of new investors have a high expected expectation for returns. They are thinking 20%, 50%. Where Warren Buffett will be struggling to achieve such returns. And very frequently, they do not understand market risk. And when you know advertisements come about teaching them how you can identify this new sexy stock, they gravitate towards it because they, they feel they can overcome risk very easily. And that may not be the case. So what are some problems in identifying risk. A first part is actually recent volatility and recent performance. If you look now in terms of the technology space, you realize that most of them have been trending upwards with low volatility, correct? That creates an illusion to investors that you know, uh, technology is actually having high returns and yet low risk. They perceive risk in technology to be low and yet giving high expected returns. That's why they are gravitating towards that. And to make things worse, when they join channels, for example, that pitch on, on uh, particular shares that have actually de delivered very strong returns in recent years, they have this group think. They join and they look at comments and they realize, hey, maybe the risk is actually quite low and yet can deliver this high expected return. So this is a key part to seriously understand. So buying something that is going up gives that perception that risk is low and buying something that has done badly for the last five years gives that perception that risk is actually high. But think about it critically. Something that has gone up has seen inflated valuations. Does that mean real risk is actually higher? And for something that's gone down conversely, has all the risk, all the negativity been sucked out of it and being overpriced in? So think about it. There's always a lot of mention that if you're a contrarian investor, you're actually investing safely. And think about it. If you think along with the crowd, usually it's wrong. If you think differently, 
you have an edge of doing well in the market. I'll let you consider on that point. Now let me run back to the article that mentioned Singapore being the worst Asian equity. And there are a few key learning points. As I've boxed up in red over here, what do you realize? Uh, Singapore Airlines and CoverDelGro are worst performers on index, going down almost half. And they've of course contributed to the negativity of the index. But nonetheless, these two, these two shares have actually very small components in STI. STI is mainly made up by banks. And what we can see over there at the top part, which I've highlighted in yellow, more than 80% of Singapore's benchmark is made of cyclical equities, which are banks, which are REITs, which are property developers. So that's why STI index is made out of these, which means when times are bad, they look worse. When times are good, they can recover. So keep that in mind. It's not the end for all this. This actually shows where STI is currently allocated towards. Do you realize a few key parts? Who are the top three holdings? Banks of Singapore. DBS, 16%. OCBC, 12%. UOB, 10 plus percent. In combination, they hold almost 39% of the index, more than a third, which means banks actually are very core to STI's performance. And of course, Singapore is a very banking economy. Banks are actually uh, regulated very heavily, very protected. You know, recently there's this incident, this, this case of ENS IPO. I've done videos on it. If you follow the channel, you can't know about it. Banking is regulated. Banking is protected. It's not going to become zero. Yes, fintech can come into the picture. Fintech is meant to complement it, but governments know they can control banking sector and governments will want to keep them alive because they have big, tremendous uh, functional use to the economy. So keep that in mind, our banks are not going anywhere. I want to value it by giving you something even more. You, what do you realize if we compare now a 10 years ago STI allocation? You realize that a lot of names are still familiar. Singdao, DBS, UOB. But what, what do you realize over there, which I boxed up, is Singtel's allocation has dropped tremendously. Right now, it's only 6 plus percent. Previously, it was 9 plus percent. Singtel is not doing fantastic. And accordingly, when, when the index buys based on market cap, it's reducing its allocation. Which means Singtel, if it doesn't do well, it will get naturally decayed in its allocation, which is still fine. That's what an index is supposed to do. But a lot of names there are very traditional. Wilma, Jardin have been there for 10 years. But what I've realized also, that REITs are increasingly being a bigger allocation. REITs are also cyclical, but REITs are also not going to zero. So there's a few, there's a few key parts that would definitely shine through when times become better. So keep that in mind, it's not all about technology. To end things with, is STI still worth your dollar cost averaging? I'd like to answer that question for you. Absolutely yes. If your dollar cost averaging and doing passive investing, let the index work its magic. The market can allocate. Banks are not going anywhere. So if you're investing in STI, also understand the weaknesses. STI indeed does not have technology allocations, which means it should be part of a portfolio, but not everything of a portfolio. A good portfolio should be diversified. It should have Asian equities. Taiwan has semicons that are listed big. Hong Kong has a lot of uh, technology co companies. So again, a globally diversified portfolio is much better than just buying a single ETF. So many years ago, people were shouting STI ETF. Also not, not, not totally correct. So hopefully that cleared up a lot of your doubts. If you are dollar cost averaging partly into STI, keep it. If you are too much in STI, yes, indeed, you should diversify. In any case, if you're not sure, you're looking for someone to help you with your portfolio, look for my contacts below. And before we end things with, I have a video that I'd like to introduce to you that's related to this. As we know, DBS has climbed in terms of its allocation. 10 years ago, it was 9 plus percent. Right now, it's 16 over percent. DBS is 16% STI, which means DBS, DBS's fate is going to really impact STI's performance. And I have a previous video on DBS. So with that video, I've actually justified DBS, what is done in terms of its history based on Asian financial crisis, based on global financial crisis. I'll show you how to kind of understand DBS valuation. And $20 is very difficult to justify, it's expensive. That video will show you more details and I'd like to invite you there. With that, I'll sign off. Take care and goodbye.